All right, are we all there? Psalm 111, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endureth forever. He hath made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He hath given meat unto them that fear Him. He will ever be mindful of His covenant. He hath showed His people the power of His works, that He may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of His hands are verity and judgment. All His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His covenant forever. Holy and reverend is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Now, keep your place in Psalms, because we're going to be coming back to Psalm. But uh, go with me, please, to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2 in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter number 2 is towards the end of the New Testament. If you're, uh, if you're in Titus or Hebrews, you've gone too far. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And I want you to look at verse number 7. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you just please be with us. Thank you, Lord, for the people that have taken the time to come to this first church service. And Father, I ask that even though we've had a good time singing and we're going to have a good time with the, with the grilling afterwards, Lord, and the fellowship, I ask that you help the people to focus and be able to take this time seriously and that we be able to learn something out of your word. Thank you, Father, for establishing this church. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank you, first of all, for coming to the very first service of Verity Baptist Church. This is the first service. And, uh, you know, you might be wondering uh, about the name of the church. It's, it's Verity Baptist Church. V-E-R-I-T-Y. Uh, and, uh, you know, the word Verity appears in the Bible, in the King James Bible, only two times. And we read both of them. One was Psalms 111.7 and uh, 1 Timothy 2.7 there. And, uh, and, and the word appears there. Now you might be wondering, well, what exactly does the word verity mean? Or why did you choose that name for the church, Verity Baptist Church? Well, the word verity means truth. And, uh, you know, some of you here speak Spanish. And, and, and you know, what the, what the, what's the word for truth in Spanish? Who knows what that? What is it? Verdad. Right. Verdad. So you see the similarities? Verdad, verity, you know, it's the same, it comes from the same root word. Um, or you might remember as, as you read the Bible, you know, you remember maybe a few times Jesus Christ, a few times He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, right? And that, that word verily is very similar to the word verity. It means truth. What Jesus Christ was saying, He was saying, you know, uh, truthfully, truthfully, you know, I, I say unto you, or of a truth, I say unto you, uh, when He would say that. So we named the church verity because it means truth. And I thought that'd be a good name for a church, Truth Baptist Church, and uh, and that's the name of the church, Verity, and um, and the, the reason we, we did that, if you're in First Timothy uh, chapter number two, right? Uh, I'm sorry, you're in First Timothy or Second Timothy? I don't even remember. First Timothy. Where. First Timothy. Okay, go to go to chapter number three. Go to First Timothy chapter number three and look at verse number fourteen. First Timothy chapter number three and look at verse fourteen. Why is uh, Verity Baptist Church a, a good name for a church? Why is Truth Baptist Church a good name for a church? And, and you'll see why I chose the name there in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. and look, uh, Verse 14 says, These things have I written unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. He says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And look what it says. The pillar and ground of the... Do you see that word? What's it say? Truth. The Bible says that God, that God said that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, you know, in our day and age, if you see pillars out on a, on a, in a building, they're, they're more or less there just for decoration. 
But if you think of, of Paul's day and, and the time when the Bible was written, the, the pillars were really there as a support, stru- uh, support system. If you think of those old Roman uh, uh, buildings and the, the, the buildings that they had back then, a lot of times they would have those pillars and those pillars would actually be there to hold up the roof or hold up uh, like the second story of a building. If you remember the story of Samson, remember when they, when they took him to, to the Philistines and he, and he asked the Lord to return his strength one more time and he asked if he could put his hands to the pillars, you remember that? And he was able to to uh, to remove those pillars and crush that entire house and kill all those Philistines. And and a pillar is there to uphold something. And the Bible doesn't say just say that the church is the pillar of truth. He says it's the pillar and the ground. So he's saying the the church is really uh, the foundation of the truth. The church is where you get truth. The church is where you learn truth. So I thought, what better name for a church than Truth Baptist Church? You know, Verity Baptist Church. And and church was established to be a place where truth should be upheld. And I really got to ask you this question: Where else are you supposed to get truth today? In our society. I mean, think about it. Where do we get truth? Do we get it from Hollywood? Uh, do we get it from all the Hollywood movies and, and, and all the movies? And you th- Think about the Hollywood movies. What are they promoting? They're promoting drugs, promoting alcohol, promoting adultery, promoting fornication, promoting filth. And really, that's, you know, is that, is that where we're going to go? If I'm, looking, if I'm searching for truth, am I going to get it from Hollywood? Am I going to get it from the television? Uh, the, the television that is used by the devil to, in order to really uh, brainwash us. You know, I was reading somewhere the average American spends three hours a day watching television. And that's three hours where you're just allowing the devil to program your mind to think whatever you want. And I'm telling you, you know, you might not like it, you might like it, whatever. But that's not where we're getting truth from. You know, we can't get truth from, from Hollywood. We can't get truth from the entertainment industry. Uh, where else can we get truth? Maybe politicians? They never lie to us, right? <laughs> Who's known a politician to tell a lie? I've, I've, I've never known a politician to tell a lie. No, they, they lie to us. So we can't get truth from Hollywood. We can't get it from the politicians. Uh, what about the government? Government schools? Think about government schools. Think about uh, colleges and universities or public schools that are teaching everything but the truth. You go down to a, a government school this morning and what are they going to teach you? They're going to teach you evolution. What is that teaching? That there is no God. Or they're going to teach you environmentalism. And what is that teaching? That Mother Earth is God. Or they're going to teach you humanism. And that's teaching that man is God. Or they're going to teach you communism, which is really saying the government is God. And we can't get the truth. We're, we're not getting the truth from anywhere else. Any of those places. The only place, the only person that offers truth is God. Let me, let me read your verse. Go back to Psalm 25. Let me read your verse while you go there. Psalm 25.5. Uh, but the Bible says in Romans 3, 4, it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. That's right. So there's no one, there's nowhere we can go for truth but God. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Are you in Psalms? Go to Psalm 25. I'm just gonna, I just want to read you a few verses. Psalm 25. You're going to have to be quick, alright? Psalm 25, 5 says, lead, Look at verse 5. Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Look at, you're in Psalm 25, look at verse 10. Psalm 25, 10, it says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as keep His covenant and His testimony. You're in Psalm 25, go to Psalm 31. Psalm 31, 5. I just want to show you a few verses. Just make a point. Psalm 31.5 says, Psalm 31.5 says, says, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Look at Psalm 33.4. Psalm 33.4. I'm going to get to learn the book of Psalms this morning. Psalm 33.4. Look what the Bible says. It says, For the word of the Lord is right. And all His works are done in truth. Now quickly, just go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, 13. So you're belaboring the point. I want you to see where we get truth from. I want you to see that God is the source of truth. Psalm 69, 13. If you're there, it says, But as for me, my prayer is unto Thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of Thy mercy, hear me, in the truth of Thy salvation. Just go with me real quick. Psalm 100, Psalm 100, verse 5. They're all in Psalms, so you should be able to get there quickly. Psalm 100, and look at verse 5. Psalm 105, the Bible says, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Go to Psalm 117. Psalm 117, and look at verse number 1. 
Psalm 117. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. For His merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, look at verse number 142. Psalm 119, look at verse 142. The Bible says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and Thy law is truth. This is the last verse. Look at same chapter, verse number 151. Psalm 119, look at verse number 151. The Bible says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all Thy commandments are truth. Now, I just showed you a whole lot of verses. I tried to make it easy. They were all in Psalms. But I just showed you a whole lot of verses where God says, God is the God of truth. God is the, go- uh, is the source of truth. And we can't get truth from anywhere else today but God. And God said that we get truth through the church. God said that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, unfortunately, today, church has become a place where people come to hear anything but the truth. Right. In fact, they come to church to get lied to. Go with me real quick. We're, we're in Timothy, right? Go to 2 Timothy. I want you to see these verses. 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, and look at verse number 3. 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, and look at verse number 3. In the, in the New Testament, 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, and look at verse number 3. The Bible says... For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's what the Bible says. And really that's, that's, the, day they, that's the day we're living in today. If most people today aren't interested in the truth. Most people today, most uh, places, buildings, churches that are are having services today are not interested in the truth because I'll I'll tell you what, church has become a place where you go to meet friends. Church has become a place where you go to uh, uh, meet business contacts. Church has become a a place to be uh, socially active. And look, we're glad that we want to be your friend and we want to have activities. And hey, we're going to have, you know, uh, candle making and and build your own ice cream and we're going to do all those things and we want to have activities and we want to socialize and we want to fellowship. But let me tell you something. Verity Baptist Church is not here to be a social gathering. It's here to preach the truth. Amen. And that's what we don't have. Today we want people that, they, the Bible says, they will not endure sound doctrine. That's why the most important part of the service is when we open up the truth from the Word of God. And we Amen. preach it. And we teach it. And we learn it. But the Bible says that they will turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. Now, very quickly, I want you to see these verses. I know we're looking at a lot of verses, but go to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah. If you're in Psalms, you want to go to the right. Isaiah is a pretty big book in the Bible. Isaiah chapter number 30. Look at chapter number 30 in verse number 9. Isaiah chapter number 30 and look at verse number 9. The Bible says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, Children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to their seers, see not. Now that word seers, that's an Old Testament word uh, for the word prophet, and you're going to see the word prophet here in a second, but, but it's a prophet or the preacher. And it, the Bible says, they say to their seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. And I'm telling you, that's where we're at today. People don't, they don't want to hear preaching. They don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to be told uh, the truth when it goes against what you're doing. You don't want to hear the truth. Hey, when you're an adultery, you don't want somebody to tell you, hey, it's a sin to be an adultery. When you're in fornication, you don't want somebody to tell you, hey, it's a sin to be in fornication. When you're uh, watching the filth of this world in the Hollywood, you don't want somebody to stand up and tell you, hey, what do those uh, movies promote? Death, drugs, alcohol, nudity. And we live in a society that doesn't want to hear the truth. And today we've got a whole lot of Christians to say, prophesy deceits unto us. And really that, that's, that's easier for the preacher. It's easier for a preacher of today to not confront the people with the truth. If you're in the book of Isaiah, just go, go to the very next book and go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 6. Jeremiah chapter number 6. The very next book after Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter number 6. And look at verse number 14. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and look at verse 14. The Bible says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughters of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
Let me read you another verse. You don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 8.11 says the exact same thing. It says, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, when you read this verse, it's kind of confusing because it says they healed also the hurt of the daughters. They did something positive. They made them feel good. But the Bible says they preached peace when there was no peace. The context here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is crying aloud and uh, he, he's, he's preaching to the, the people of Israel and he's letting them know that God is bringing destruction from the north and God is bringing judgment because of their sin. And, and Jeremiah says these preachers have stood up and they, they make the people feel good. They've healed their hurt because they tell them, hey, don't you worry. God isn't going to judge you. God isn't going to destroy you. There, there's peace. There's peace. But God says there's a problem with that because the problem destruction is coming. And there is a hell. And there is judgment. And it would be easier for me to say, there's no hell. There's no such thing. We're going to die and we're just going to be in eternal sleep. That would be a lot easier for me to do, right? But that's not the truth. And I might be able to heal your hurt by uh, not mentioning uh, something that may be hurtful towards you. But I may be preaching peace, but if there's no peace, it's of no value. And it's easier for a preacher to do that. And the problem with churches all across our nation refusing to preach truth is this. It's had an effect on our society. It's had an effect on our nation. The effect that this type of preaching has had on our society is this. That we've gotten to the place where we don't even recognize the truth. Let me me show you a verse. Please go with me to John chapter number 8. In the New Testament, John chapter number 8, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is the fourth book in the Bible. John chapter number, in the New Testament, John chapter number, I'm sorry, I said 8, look at verse number 18. John 18, look at verse number 37. John chapter 18, and look at verse number 37. Now the context of this verse, uh, just so you know, this is right before Jesus Christ is getting ready to be crucified. And he's talking with Pilate, uh, and, you know, he's being judged by Pilate right before his crucifixion. And, and look what it says, John chapter number 18, and look at verse number 37. The Bible says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou savest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Look at verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, And look at this question that Pilate asked. He asked this question, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all. Now here's the problem with that. You might not understand that, but let let me read a few verses to you. You don't have to turn there, but just let me read these verses to you. Here's the problem with asking Jesus Christ what is truth. Let me let me read. Matthew 22, 16 says this. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, they're talking to Jesus Christ. And they say, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. And the word... Oh, let, me read, let me read another verse for you. That was Matthew 22, 16. Uh, look at... Oh, you don't have to look, but let me read John chapter number 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh. Talking about Jesus Christ. It says, And dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And look what it says. Talking about Jesus Christ. It says, Full of grace and truth. Let me read another verse for you. John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Are you, are you understanding the point I'm trying to make? Just in case you don't get it, John 14, 6 spells it out. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, this is what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is truth. And if you understand what's going on, Pilate is getting ready to crucify Jesus Christ. And he's looking at Jesus Christ. I mean, I just envisioned this in my mind. He's looking at our Lord Jesus Christ in the face. He's looking eye to eye, staring at the truth. And he asks this question, what is truth? And that's that's the society we live in. You can confront somebody with the truth and they'll say, well, what is truth? And really, I mean, how else can you explain the craziness that is going on in our nation? How how do you explain? You're in the state of California, you you probably know this. How do you explain same-sex marriage? I mean, think about it. Somebody somebody told my wife this recently, and I I don't even really like to to say this. Uh, I don't even want to think about it, but but someone said to my wife, and it was a good thought, they said, uh, 
Uh, just forget about what the media shows you or tells you about same-sex marriage, about homosexuals, about sodomites. Just forget about what the media shows you and just think about what they do behind closed doors. Just for a brief second, just think about what they do. The actual actions they perform. And you've got to think to yourself, and, and how, how does that happen? How does somebody think that's normal? How does somebody think that's, that's a natural thing to happen? And, and I'm telling you, it's because we live in a society that, that you confront them with the truth and they say, like Pilate, well, what is truth? You're looking at it. You're talking to them. And you're questioning what, what is truth. You're like, well, I don't like you mentioning uh, homosexuals. Well, I, I told you that we're here to preach the Bible, so let me just show you some verses. Go to Romans chapter number 1, but let me read you a verse. Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. That's what Leviticus 18.22 says. You say, well, that's the Old Testament, okay? Uh, let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1, verse 25. It's interesting. We're preaching about the truth. It's interesting what the Bible says about that. Romans chapter number 1. Look at verse number 20, 25. I want you to look at it. Don't leave here today and say that, well, that guy was preaching all these things and I didn't like it. If you leave here today and you didn't like it, you didn't like the truth. You didn't like the Bible. Because look what the Bible says. Romans 1, 25. It's very interesting what God says about these sodomites. These, he says, who changed the truth of God into a, what's it say? Lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them unto vile affections. God says it's vile. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. And just in case you're wondering, that's AIDS, by the way. Verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murderers, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's what the Bible says. Can we get any more New Testament than Romans? Not only do the same, but look what it says, but have pleasure in them that do them. God says, they are worthy of death. But he says, you have pleasure in them that do them. See, when you turn on that television show, you turn on that zipcom, uh, uh, zipcom there, and it has that uh, a homosexual on there. And he's a funny character, right? He's a flamboyant, funny character. always doing, and, you, and you laugh at that, and you take pleasure in that. God talks about that. See, I don't like that type of preaching. I know. That's, that's the point of the sermon. Our society doesn't like truth. Our society doesn't like truth. You confront someone with truth, and, and like Pilate, what is truth? I mean, how could, how could somebody look at this and say, homosexuality is completely normal. God, God made us this way. It doesn't seem... I mean, God eventually gave you over and made you that way, but you weren't born that way. It's unnatural, is what the Bible says. And that's the society we live in. That's why we live in a society where, where one judge can overturn the, the vote of most of California and say, same-sex marriage is okay. And here's the problem, and here's the honest truth. You know why we've gotten to this place? Is because preachers all across this country refuse to mount their pulpits and just preach the truth of the Word of God and say, no, it's filth, it's sin, it's reprobate, it's wrong, it's, it's worthy of death, and we're not going to have pleasure in them that do that. That's what we should be saying. I wish Baptist churches all across America would be standing up tonight and preaching the truth. The sad thing is they're not. They're preaching version, they're preaching their 123rd you know, series on the God, on the love of God, and, and, and trust me, there's love of God. But good night. We got to preach the truth. How, how else do you? And just think about it. Just think about it. Our, our society today doesn't understand the truth. They look at the truth. They don't understand. It. How do you? How do you explain abortion? How do you explain abortion? I, I think it was. I think it was Brother Campbell. I'm not. Correct me if I'm wrong. Just not in public. I think it was Brother Campbell. I was talking to recently, and his. his uh, his wife is uh, is with child. She's pregnant, and uh, and and he was talking about he got those uh, what are those things called ultrasounds. Is that what they're called? 
I'm not a woman, so I don't. My wife would know. Ultrasound. That's what it's called, right? He, and, uh, was it you? We were talking about this? And uh, he was looking at that picture from his, from his son's ultrasound. And he was comparing it to the ultrasound from his first son, his, his uh, uh, Josiah, who's like uh, one year old or two years old. And he, he, he was telling me, and it was interesting. I thought this was interesting. He was looking at the picture from his son, Josiah. And he was looking at the other picture from his unborn child. And he was able to tell which one was which. He was able to look at the, the ultrasound from, from his son, Josiah. And based on that picture, he could recognize Josiah. And I was thinking to myself, you know, our society wants us to think that that baby is not alive. Our society wants us to think that that baby is a clump of cells, it's an embryo, it's a fetus, they want to call it whatever, but God says it is a human being. Uh, Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed thee in the belly, God is talking to Jeremiah, he says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto a nation. God said, before you were born, I had a purpose for your life. Before you were born, I had a ministry for you. I had Imagine if Jeremiah's mom would have aborted him. We wouldn't have the prophet Jeremiah today. Children of Israel wouldn't have had Jeremiah today. And I'm telling you, we need a church. We need a place where the word of God is going to be preached. We need a place in Sacramento. We need a place in California where someone's going to stand up and say, No, we're going to preach the truth. Amen. Well, you're not going to build a church that way. I'm not interested in building a church. I'll tell you right now, I, I am not in the business of church building. You say, Well, why are you starting a church? It's not my purpose to, to build churches. God, the Bible says, let me, let me show you some verses. Go to Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Say, Pastor Jimenez, the way you're preaching, you're, you're, you're going to scare a crowd, you're not going to gather a crowd, you're not going to build a church, you're going to fail miserably. You're not going to build a church. But I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in, in, in church building. Let me show you. Go to your Matthew 16. Look at verse number 18. Matthew 16. Look at verse number 18. This was, these are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... Now remember, Jesus Christ is talking. He says, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. According to Matthew 16, 18, whose job is it to build the church? Is it my job, or is it Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ said, I will build a church. If, uh, go to Acts 2.47. You're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter number 2 and look at verse 47. Acts chapter number 2 and look at verse number 47. The Bible says, Acts 2.47, it says, Praising God. I'll wait for you to get there. Acts 2.47. The Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And look what it says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Bible says that the Lord added to the church. Go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians. You're in Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Chapter number 3 and look at verse 5. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 3 and look at verse 5. The Bible says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. It says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Let me tell you something. God is in charge of giving the increase. God is in charge of building the church. God is, if, if this church grows, God did it. If this church collapses and fails, God did it. I, it's not my business to build a church. You know what I'm in business to do? Preach the truth. Amen. I, I'm here to preach the Word of God. And if you come, then you come. If you don't, then you don't. It doesn't matter. We're going to preach the truth. And, and California is going to know that there's a church that's going to preach the truth. So well, that goes against society. That goes against the popular view. That goes against most of California. I don't care who it goes against. I'm with God. Amen. And me and God, hey, we're a majority. So that's good. That's good. I'm not interested in... In, uh, in growing a church. I'm not interested in, uh, in growing a ministry, but I, I do want to do this. I want to just take a moment and let, let you know about us. We're Verity Baptist Church. We're a brand new church. So I want to tell you what type of church we are. And, and the reason is this. I've been preaching all this about preaching the truth, and, and I've noticed in my, my life as I've gone to different churches, a lot of times churches, they, they try to kind of hide what they believe. I don't know if that makes sense. But they, they, they're hoping
assume that when you come, they can kind of just string you along enough time to where you, you just keep coming and you give money, you know. And then they, they try to just not tell you everything they believe. That way you won't get offended and leave. And, and look, this is Verity Baptist Church, Truth Baptist Church. If you're going to get the truth anyway, it's going to be here. So I'm just, I just want to take the very first service and just tell you a little bit about ourselves, just so you know what we believe, just so you know what, what, what you're getting into if you decide to stay. And let, let me give you just a few things of what we believe. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. Amen. This means that salvation, I'm talking about when you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that means that you don't spend eternity in hell, you spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. That, this means that salvation, we believe, cannot be earned by any work. That means church attendance, that means baptism, that means repenting of your sins. Anything else you want to add to that? We don't believe that you can earn salvation. Salvation is given to you by Jesus Christ, by simply putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You're putting your faith in the fact that He died, was buried, and He rose from the grave, and that pays for my salvation, not my works. So we believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Say, where is that in the Bible? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You like how I took the point pretty much from the Bible? So you can't argue with it. Let me tell you what else we believe. We believe in, eternal, in the eternal security of the believer. I had somebody, I was knocking on doors down the street here, and I was inviting people to church, and this guy comes up to me, he's, are you one of these once saved, always saved? And he said it like I was supposed to be like, oh, you know, embarrassed or whatever. I said, you know what? Yes, Amen. I am. Amen. Yes. Once saved, always saved. That's what we believe. We believe in eternal security of the believer. Once saved, always saved. Just like there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Once I've got it, there's nothing I can do to lose it. So I didn't earn it, and I can't lose it. God gave it to me, and God says He'll never take it away. That's why He calls it eternal life. It means it'll last forever, eternal. It will never end, everlasting. You want a verse? Titus one two says, "In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began." You say, "Well, well, I, I believe that you get saved and God gives you eternal life, but then if you commit adultery and God takes it away, well, you just call God a liar." And God says He doesn't lie. So if He gives you eternal life, He says, in hope of eternal life. He says, our hope for eternal life is this. God can't lie. Right. And if God promised me eternal life, if God promised me everlasting life, that means it's going to be eternal. It means it's going to be last forever. Well, what about the sins that you commit in the future? I don't know if you understand this, but when Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, all your sins were in the future. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody here that's more than 2,000 years old? <laughs> And, and more than that, the Bible says that Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right. So there's no human being that can say, well, what about my future sins? God, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died for your future sins, your past sins, your present sins. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's forever. And God can't lie. What else do you believe? Well, we believe this. We believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. We believe that God inspired and preserved it. The King James Bible is our sole authority in this church in all matters of faith and doctrine. Now, I want you to listen to me, please. Before you just turn me off, just listen to what I have to say. John 17, 17. And write it down if you need to look at it. John 17, 17 says this. Sanctify them through thy truth. That's what we're talking about, right? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. That's what the Bible says. Now, just think about it. And when I, when I first got taught about this King James Bible issue, somebody gave me a real deep uh, statement, and I, I'm going to give it to you uh, this morning. And I, I'm going to give you some time. If you need to pull out a piece of paper and a pen to write this down, because uh, it's going to be real deep, you're going to be impressed. You're going to be like, man, that is one smart guy. After I give you the statement, all right? <laughs> Here it goes. You ready? Things that are different are not the same. Is that deep? Who, who did not understand? That went over some of your heads. Let me say it again. I, some of you are looking at me like, what? Things that are different are not the same. Now, now just, just logic with me for a second. If I've got two Bibles, and they both claim to be the Word of God, and one says one thing, and the other says another thing, one of them is lying. Does that make sense? See, we believe in... Our, we, you, you talk to most Christians, they'll say, I believe that the original uh, Textus Receptus, or, or original Greek, or original Hebrew, uh, was inspired by God. And, and this is what they believe. They honestly believe this. That God could use a man to, in, to write down the words that He wanted perfectly. And most Christians would say, Amen. But then they don't believe that that same God is powerful enough to use a man to preserve His Word through the ages. 
And let me tell you something. If God spent so many hundreds and, and thousands of years to give us His Word, using multiple writers in all different nations, to allow it to go to waste after the first generation of it being translated, wouldn't that just be the biggest waste of time? The Bible says that God will preserve His Word. It was His job to inspire it, and it's His job to preserve it, and we believe that God has preserved it in the English language in the King James Bible, and that's our stand here at our church, and that's where we believe it. You say, well, how do you know it's a King James and not the other one? Well, I'll explain to you like this. What, what, are, those, uh, what are those fake diamonds called? I never know what they're called. You know, the one you gave to your wife? You know what I'm talking about? What are, they, what are they called? Cubic zirconium? The, the guy who's not married says it. <laughs> he knows where he's going. You know, let's say I had a barrel full of those uh, fake diamonds. I, I wouldn't know. See, I, I give my wife the real thing. Let's say I had a barrel full of those, what, what are they called? Cubic zirconiums? And let's say that I just drop a real diamond in the midst of it. Just shake it up. And I take it to a, a I don't know, a jeweler? Who, who are the people who like study diamonds and all that? A jeweler? You think that he'll be, you know, if, if I tell him, hey, there's a real diamond in there, or can you, can you find it? You think he'll be able to? You know, grab his little... Thing of a jigger, I don't know. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you think you'll be able to, how, how will he know the real one from the fake one? What's he going to do? He's going to compare them, right? You're going to take all these fake ones, and then eventually you'll be able to tell the difference from the real ones and the fake ones. I used to work, uh, one of the very first jobs I had, actually my sister got me this job, it's kind of funny. I used to work at a check cashing store. And I remember um, they would, we, we would cash checks and we dealt with a lot of money, you know, and they would, they would, uh, you know, every once in a while, counterfeit money would come in, and they show it to us, and they put it on a board or whatever. But you know what was the best training for being able to find counterfeit money? Is to deal with the real thing. Because you're dealing with real money all day, all day, all day, all day, and when the fake one comes in, you can tell. You can tell very quickly, just by the touch. How do you, how do you know which one's fake? You compare it to the real thing. And if you take the King James Version of the Bible, and you take all these other Bibles, and you start comparing them, and you start seeing, well, wait a minute, this, this Bible took uh, 14 verses out of the New Testament, and, and this Bible uh, took this verse, which messes with this doctrine, and, this, and you start seeing, and, you start, and if you study it out, you start seeing which one's the real dime. And if you're interested, you know, if you're interested in the subject, I don't want you to leave here and say, just because you don't understand, if you're interested in the subject, come back Wednesday night, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We have a prayer meeting, and we have a Bible study, and... Wednesday night, we're going to be dealing with the subject about the Word of God. And if you're interested in that subject, and you want to learn more about that, just come on down, give us a chance to explain to you from the Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and we'll also be comparing Scripture with unscripture, and, and showing you uh, why we believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. But, I want to be truthful with you, and just let you know. Uh, but that's what we believe here. We believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. We believe this, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible says in Philippians 2.6, Who, talking about Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why was it robbery to be equal with God? Because He was God. Jesus Christ is God. You don't believe me? Go to Matthew 1, and you'll see that the angel told uh, Joseph there, and he said uh, that he's gonna, he told him to name Jesus Christ Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. Now why would heaven, why would an angel tell him to name Jesus Christ a name that means God with us. I'm, I'm telling you why. Because Jesus Christ was God with us. So go. So you tell any Jehovah's Witness you want that Jesus Christ is God. And, and that's what we believe. You don't like it? I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says and that's what we believe. We believe in the autonomy of the local church. What does that mean? That means we are independent of all denominations, conventions, and fellowships. We have Jesus Christ and the Bible as the head of our church and not some pope prophet, president, board of directors. We don't have anybody over us but Jesus Christ. Amen. And since we believe in that, in the fact of the local church doctrine of being independent, we also reject the teaching of the universal church. You need a verse for that? Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. God says that Christ is the head of the church. That means, I didn't, get, I didn't get my sermon this morning, I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't get my sermon sent to me from, uh, you know, Utah or something. I got it from the Word of God. Amen. I got it from Jesus Christ. And that's the head of the church. You say, well, Pastor Emanuel, are you, are, you are you running the church? Are you the head of the church? I'm not the head of the church. Look, I'm a brother just like you. I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, I'm a brother, amen. No. I'm, a, I'm a sinner just like you. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Now, I may be 
given the, the uh, authority to preach and I'm going to be doing the administration of the church, but Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So we don't have anything, it, it's like this, it's, it's Jesus Christ or it's the church and then Jesus Christ. Here's the denomination, the church, you know, the archbishop, then the pope or the board of the rectors and the president or whatever and then the prophet and then God, no, 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 it's Jesus Christ then the church. And that's what we believe. We're independent. And we don't have any and we don't have a, any problem letting you know that. Let me show you this verse. I, I want to show you this verse. Go to Revelation chapter number 20. We're almost done, I promise. Revelation chapter number 20. It's the last the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter number 20, and look at verse number 12. Revelation chapter number 20 and look at verse number 12. <clears throat> we believe that the unsaved will spend eternity tormented in a literal hell and eventually the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 12. I want you to see this verse. The Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. I'm sorry. Am I reading the right? I think I got it on the wrong verse. Verse 13 says, And the seed gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Look at verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you're in Revelation 20. Look at verse number 10. Revelation 20, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. We believe in a literal hell where the unsaved will spend eternity. I showed this verse to somebody and they said, well, I said, they said, well, we don't believe that hell the way you believe. And I said, well, well, I believe hell the way the Bible says. And I read to them Revelation 20.10. And I said, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And I saw him, look, it says, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And he said, well, well, that forever and ever doesn't mean forever and ever. He said, that forever and ever, you know, and, and this is what he said. He said, you know, it's kind of like when you, you're going to fight with your best friend and you say, I'm not talking to you forever. You know, that could be 20 years, but that's not forever and ever. I, I thought to myself, and you know, that's good. I, I'm impressed that you can say that with a straight face. <laughs> but the Bible says, day and night, forever and ever. And we believe it. We believe that there is a lake of fire. We believe that it, there is a hell. Why is that so important? Well, here's why. Because we also believe in personal soul winning. Amen. Matthew twenty eight nineteen says, Go ye therefore into go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Luke ten one says, After these things the Lord appointed over seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Maybe you're here today and you're here because you got an invitation on your door. Or maybe you're here today because I, I went to your house and I invited you. Maybe you're here today because, and, and you say, well, you're inviting people because you're starting a church. And that's true. I was inviting people because because we're starting a church. But more importantly than that, I was out knocking doors trying to teach people the gospel. Why? Because there is a hell. If you, knock, if, I, if you open the door, I'm more than likely, unless you were rude to me, I'm more than likely asking you this question. Do you know for sure if you die today, if you go to heaven or hell, are you not sure? And if you gave me the time, I showed you from the Bible how you can know for sure. That's what we believe. We believe in soul winning. We believe that there is a hell. We believe that man will spend eternity in hell unless they accept Jesus Christ. And God said we must go. That's why this afternoon after the, uh, after, the, after the barbecue, a bunch of us guys are going to get a bunch of invitations. We're going to go out into this community and we're going to be knocking on doors. You say, well, what do you do for outreach? We go out to the community and we preach Jesus Christ. That's what we do. I know other churches, they, they, uh, they have movie night and I know they have a sleepover and I know that they have all these little activities, but we just open the Word of God and preach the truth and try to tell people how not to spend eternity in hell. Yeah. And that's what we believe. We are a soul winning church. We believe in confrontational soul winning. That's not being rude. That just means that we personally go to you and we confront you and ask you, do you know where you're spending eternity? Churches today, because they don't want to preach the word, they believe in, in these things. Uh, they call it lifestyle evangelism. They say, well, you live your life a certain way and, and you live in a good testimony and you're going to, uh, and people are going to ask you how to be saved. Let me tell you something. 
I'm a mechanic uh, in, in the Air Force, and I, my whole entire four years that I've been enlisted in the Air Force, I've never been out on the floor working on a heater or working on a generator, you know, uh, changing a filter, and have somebody come up to me and say, man, you know what, the way you changed that tie was so valuable. And they just fell on their knees and said, I, I need what you've got. I, I need your Jesus. I, I, I was watching you change that filter, and the glory of God showing on you. No one's ever said that to me. You know how we leave people, Lord? I walk up to them and I open my mouth and I say, Do you know if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And Jesus Christ said, Go ye therefore into all the world. That's what we believe. And we're not ashamed of it. Amen. I just want to be truthful with you tonight. Okay. Say, Pastor Jimenez, or today, Pastor Jimenez, why, why are you preaching all this? What's the point of all this? Here's the point. We're done. Just go with me please to Proverbs 23. The book of Proverbs... Chapter number 23. Proverbs 23. And look at verse number 23. Proverbs 23. And look at verse number 23. The Bible says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now God said, Buy the truth and sell it not. Let me, let me show you something. God tells us not to sell the truth. Alright? So that's why at, at uh, Verity Baptist Church, we will not ever sell you anything. We will pass an offering plate because that's biblical. God tells us to do that. But we're not going to sell you anything. We're not going to have a bookstore and sell you books. We're not going to sell you a Bible. If we gave you a Bible and you want that Bible, take it home. Amen. It's yours. You want a hymn book? Take it home. It's yours. Just don't let me know. But no, nah, I'm just kidding. We're, we'll give it to you. We're not, we don't sell anything. We don't have bookstores. We're not here to make merchandise because God says don't sell the truth. So we'll just give it to you. You know, you want to come to the candle uh, making class? No charge. Just come. Just don't sign up and not show up. <laughs> but, uh, but we're not going to sell you anything because God says not to sell. Now this is interesting. God tells you don't sell the truth. But look at the verse. It says buy the truth and sell it not. So God says don't sell the truth. But if you can purchase it, purchase it. See, God is not against you purchasing truth. He's only against you selling. And here's why. There's a value to truth. The Bible says that ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if something is valuable enough to give me freedom, and something is valuable enough to give me eternal life, God says that there's a value to that truth, and if you've got to purchase it, then purchase it. He said, buy it. I don't want you to sell it, but if you've got to buy it, buy it. And he's talking here about a monetary thing, but here's the point. The truth may cost you something. The truth may cost you a relationship with a friend. The truth may cost you a relationship with a mother or a father or a husband or a wife. The truth may cost you something uh, monetary. I, I remember before we started this church, my wife and I moved here to Sacramento. And uh, we were sent out to start this church by our church in Vacaville, California, Fellowship Baptist Church in the ministry of Pastor Mark Lewis. He trained us for the ministry and he sent us out biblically to start this church. And for a while, when we were living in Sacramento, and, and we had to drive to Vacaville to go to church. And we, you know, Vacaville is about 50 minutes from here. And we drove there uh, Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And he said, well, Pastor Menace, couldn't you have found a church uh, in the area that you could have gone to? And yeah, I could have found a building that caused itself a church to go to, but I probably wouldn't have got the truth. And I was interested in the truth. So there was a cost to that. I mean, literally, a financial cost. I had to go to the gas pump every week and put gas in that vehicle, right? And, and, it, and we spent time, but we were willing to do it because of the truth. Now, please listen to me. I'm not telling, if, you, if you're here for the first service and you came to support us and, and you traveled, I'm not telling you to, you know, travel and come to my church. That's not what I'm saying, okay? You, know, you Arizona guys, I'm not saying come here every week. You obviously have a great church uh, you go to, and if you've got a good church that you go to, then go, go to that church. So I'm not saying that, I'm just using it as an example. It would have been easy for me to say, man, it's just far away, you know, economy is bad, gas is expensive, but there was a value to truth. I said, I'm going to purchase the truth. I'll buy the truth. I'm not going to sell it. But if it costs me something to get the truth, I'm going to get it. And it may cost you something. It may cost you to lose your Sunday night to come back tonight and listen to the truth. It may cost you your Wednesday night to come back on Wednesday night and learn why you should be reading the King James Bible. It may, it may cost you something. But God says, buy it. Buy the truth and sell it not because there's a value to it. Now here, here's the conclusion and I'm done. Look, I'm closing my Bible. I'm done. What you don't know is that I got my verses up here. <laughs> You've got two options. Here are the options. If you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor Jimenez, 
you are insane. I don't like your kind of preaching. I don't like what you said. I don't like you. I don't like your house. And um, I'm never coming back. Hey, no, honestly, here's the answer. Here's what I would honestly say to you. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you supporting us, our very first service here at Mary Baptist Church. I hope you'll stay for the barbecue, and you know, you made it this far, you might as well stay for the free food. So, and I honestly say, thank you very much for coming, no hard feelings. And you know what? If you want, I'll help you find a church to go to that won't be so direct. And here's what we'll do. We'll take you out, out here to the front. I heard, I heard my good friend say this, and I really liked it. We'll take you out here to the front, to the front lawn here, and we'll blindfold you, and we'll just put your, you can put your hand out like this. My son, my 10-month-old son is in the stage where he's just like pointing at everything. So we'll, 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 we'll get my son to show you how to do it. And you just put your hand out like this, we'll blindfold you, we'll throw you around a few times and kind of let you spin. And just wherever you land, just start walking that direction. I'm sure you can find a church in that direction that'll be more than happy to prophesy lies to you. Right? If you don't like it. I'm sure it's very easy. Just open the phone book and the first one you see, just go to that one. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to preach peace when there is no peace. But if you're here today and you say, well, I don't really like the sermon, but I'm interested in the truth. I don't really like your style, but I'm tired of getting liked. Then I would simply ask you this. Come join us here at Truth Baptist Church. Come join us here at Verity Baptist Church, where I can promise you this. I can't promise you that you're going to get a great orator for a preacher. I can't promise you that you're going to get beautiful facilities. I can't promise you anything, but I can promise you this. Every week we will be opening the Word of God and preaching the truth. And if you're interested in the truth, then come join us at Verity Baptist Church. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your Bible. And Lord, we're not ashamed of your scriptures. We're not ashamed of what we believe. We're not trying to hide it. And we're not trying to lie to people and string them along. We want them to know exactly what we believe. We want them to know that we love them. That's why we're preaching the truth. And Lord, I ask that you would not allow one person to leave here today and say, and let, and say they're mad at this church or mad at this preacher. That they would understand if they leave here today, they're mad at the Word of God. Everything we preach is getting straight out of the Bible. Everything we preach is getting straight out of the Scriptures. And if they say, I didn't like that, then they didn't like the truth. And Lord, I ask that you would establish this church as a place where people would come and say, I'm hungry for the truth. I want to know the truth. I'm tired of being lied to. And they come join us here at Truth Baptist Church, Very Baptist Church. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us. I pray that you would be with the fellowship that is to come. And your questions they might pray. Amen. 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 Take your songbooks, please. Let's sing a song before we uh, before we leave. And turn to page number 275. 275. 275, barely, barely. 275, barely, barely. Oh, what a savior that he died for me.
it says, good news, shout. Now, if you're a man, I want you to shout when it says shout, all right? On the fourth. Though unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not cast out. He that believeth all the good news, shout! Have everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. being a part of our very first service. I'm so glad you're here, and I want to invite you tonight. We're going to have a, a Sunday evening service at 6 p.m. It's a completely different service. It's a different uh, sermon. Uh, we're, we'll be in a different text of the Bible, completely different. We're just learning a new truth tonight, and uh, we're going to have that. We're going to be doing something special uh, with the music. We'll be taking some favorites and, and stuff like that, so we're going to have a lot of fun. I'd like to invite you tonight, 6 p.m., also Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we have a Bible study and a prayer meeting, and uh, I'd like to invite you to come out to that also, and uh, of course, stay for the for the food afterwards. Um, I'm so glad you're here. If there's anything I can do for you, if, if you take one of those invitations, my cell phone number is on that invitation. If there's anything I can do for you, please do not hesitate to call. Uh, if you need anything, just need something to pray about, need somebody to talk to, Give me a call. I'd love to help you uh, as long as you're not asking for money. <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, thank you so much for, for being with us. And I'm going to ask Brother Brett. Brother Brett. I uh, sing Brother Dave, but I had him pray for the offering. So, Brother Brett, would you mind uh, praying to close the service? Of course. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much that we're able to gather together here, Lord, and hear your word preached to us, Lord, the pillar of ground of truth. Lord, I just pray and ask that you uh, bless the fellowship that we have later and help the food to nourish our bodies, Lord. And just to bless everybody that goes out later today and that goes door to door to preach the truth and to uh, allow people the opportunity to hear your word preached. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.